Clint Smith, welcome to the Livewire house party. It's good to be back. Yeah, uh, we missed you. This book is is a really incredible piece of writing and research. Uh, what were you trying to understand uh, for yourself when you started working on this? Yeah, so so this book began in earnest in 2017, uh, in, in the month of May, um, over the course of several weeks when uh, three different Confederate statues in my hometown in New Orleans came down, a statue to Robert E. Lee, PGT Beauregard, Jefferson Davis, all leaders of the Confederacy. And I was watching these statues come down, these statues that had been part of the iconography of my uh, childhood and part of the landscape of my childhood, and and thinking about what it meant that there were more homages in this majority black city to enslavers than there were enslaved people, right? Like, what does it mean that in order to get to school, I had to go down Robert E. Lee Boulevard? What does it mean that in order to get to the grocery store, I had to go down Jefferson Davis Highway? What does it mean that my middle school was named after a Confederate leader, that my parents live on a street named after somebody who owned 150 enslaved people, that I would go on tours when I was a child of plantations and nobody would say the word slavery. Um, and how does that happen in this place? Uh, and and what are the implications of that? You know, what, not, because we know that memorials and monuments and historical landmarks and and the names of streets and the names of schools are not merely symbols and they are not merely names. They are reflections of stories that a society tells itself. And those stories embed themselves into the narratives that, uh, that people, that, that shape our collective memory and understanding of a place. And, and those narratives shape public policy and public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives. And so I wanted to, to understand how my own hometown was sort of thinking about and, and, discussing or failing to discuss its relationship to the history of slavery. And then I kind of broadened it out and, and just got really interested in how uh, different places across the country as a whole, and even across the ocean, um, reckon with their own relationship to this history. Is it something that they confront directly? Is it something that they run from? Is it Are they doing something in between? Um, and I kind of went on this four-year journey uh, that led me to uh, dozens of places, but eight of which I document in the book. Um, that is uh, considering the ways that this country is a sort of patchwork of experiences um, and a patchwork of stories when it comes to how we tell the story of slavery and the way that it shaped the contemporary landscape of inequality. I thought it was interesting that the title of this book is How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. Mm. Uh, that read to me as uh, signaling this is not just something in the Deep South. This mm. goes up to Manhattan. This really, I mean, this entire country is affected by this legacy. Absolutely. And, you know, most of the places in the book are uh, in the South, um, given that I grew up in the South, given that the history of slavery uh, is, is saturated um, in the South, given the history of the Confederacy. Uh, but I also didn't want the reader to, uh, as some do, um, fall into the trap um, of thinking that this was something that was singularly a Southern problem. And that's why I have a chapter on New York City. Um, that's why I have a chapter on even Texas, right? Texas is some a place that is in the South, but oftentimes when people think of Texas, it's not in co connection to slavery. It's in connection to, you know, cowboys and Westerns and um, thinking about uh, this, you know, Texas as its sort of own independent entity um, that is somehow not linked to this history that it is actually deeply linked to. Um, and even, you know, going to, as I mentioned, uh, across the ocean, I went to Dakar, Senegal, um, cause I really wanted, I was spending all these times at all this time at plantations and cemeteries and all these places here. And I got increasingly curious about how the story of slavery is told from the place where the transatlantic slave trade began, right? Like how are young West African students learning about slavery and, and what is, how, what is the site of memorialization for the, the the place of departure for enslaved people and captured Africans? How do they tell that story? And how is that in in conversation with um, the place where they ended up and their destination, which is these these plantations? And so I wanted to put these places, all of these places in conversation with one another um, in order to, to create a, a sort of fuller survey of um, what slavery was uh, and, and how people continue to tell the story or, or fail to tell the story of what it was. This is Livewire. We're talking to Clint Smith. His new book is How the Word is Passed. Um, 
there's a part of this book that talks about what it was like for you to have so much uh, sort of of the Confederate world thrust upon you. Um, and, and that's actually based on a poem that you wrote about about New Orleans and growing up there. Could you read that for us? Yeah. So, you know, as someone who writes across genre, um, I often within the same topic will move. You know, I'll, I'll think that something begins as a poem and then it will uh, demand uh, a different form, uh, demand more space. Um, and so that was kind of what happened here. I When I first started thinking about these questions, I was writing a bunch of poems because poems are the way that I uh, sort of wrestle with questions I don't have the answers to. Um, and, and poetry is my sort of origin story as a, as a writer. Um, and I appreciate the, the way that poetry gives me freedom to, like, you don't have to make an argument. You don't have to have the right answer. Um, it allows you to sort of home in on a question or an idea or, or a moment and explore it in its most granular way. And for me, it's also just a way of thinking. You know, I, I write poems to in a way that allows me to think, um, thinking as writing, if you will. And so this is a poem that I wrote uh, at the beginning of the process of writing this book. And I think this poem uh, demonstrated for me, gave me clarity, I'll say, about what um, what I was trying to do and, and why these questions felt so, um, so proximate and, and so pertinent to me. Growing up, the iconography of the Confederacy was an ever-present fixture of my daily life. Every day on the way to school, I passed a statue of PGT Beauregard riding on horseback, his Confederate uniform slung over his shoulder, and his military cap pulled far down over his eyes. As a child, I did not know who PGT Beauregard was. I did not know he was the man who ordered the first attack that opened the Civil War. I did not know he was one of the architects who designed the Confederate battle flag. I did not know he led an army predicated on maintaining the institution of slavery. What I knew is that he looked like so many of the other statues that ornamented the edges of this city. These copper garlands of a past that saw truth as something that should be buried underground and silenced by the soil. After the war, the sons and daughters of the Confederacy reshaped the contours of treason into something they could name as honorable. They called it the lost cause, and it crept its way into textbooks that attempted to cover up a crime that was still unfolding. They told us that Robert E. Lee was an honorable man, guilty of nothing but fighting for the state and the people that he loved, that the Southern flag was about heritage and remembering those slain fighting to preserve their way of life. But see, the thing about the lost cause is that it's only lost if you're not actually looking. The thing about heritage is that it's a word that also means I'm ignoring what we did to you. I was taught the Civil War wasn't about slavery, but I was never taught how the declarations of Confederate secession had the promise of human bondage carved into its stone. I was taught the war was about economics, but I was never taught that in 1860, the four million enslaved black people were worth more than every bank, factory, and railroad combined. I was taught the Civil War was about states' rights, but I was never taught how the Fugitive Slave Act could care less about a border and spell Georgia and Massachusetts the exact same way. It's easy to look at a flag and call it heritage when you don't see the black bodies buried behind it. It's easy to look at a statue and call it history when you ignore the laws written in its wake. I come from a city abounding with statues of white men on pedestals and black children playing beneath them, where we played trumpets and trombones to drown out the Dixie song that still whistled in the wind. In New Orleans, there are over 100 schools, roads, and buildings named for Confederates and slaveholders. Every day, Black children walk into buildings named after people who never wanted them to be there. Every time I returned home, I would drive on streets named for those who would have wanted me in chains. Go straight for two miles on Robert E. Lee. Take a left on Jefferson Davis. Make the first right on Claiborne. Translation, go straight for two miles on the general who slaughtered hundreds of black soldiers who were trying to surrender. Take a left on the president of the Confederacy who made the torture of black bodies the cornerstone of his new nation. Make the first right on the man who permitted the heads of rebelling slaves to be put on stakes and spread across the city in order to prevent the others from getting any ideas. What name is there for this sort of violence? What do you call it when the road you walk on is named for those who imagined you under a noose? What do you call it when the roof over your head is named after people who would have wanted the bricks to crush you? That's Clint Smith. His new book is How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. 
those are really difficult words to hear. Um, I can only imagine for you uh, the experience of researching this book and of really immersing yourself in the trauma of 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 enslaved people in this country. What was that like for you, just emotionally? And like, how are you doing? I mean, there were certainly difficult moments. Um, you know, I think anytime you are deeply engaged in the historiography of slavery um, and and engaged intimately intimately with the stories of those who were enslaved and and their testimonies of of the conditions that they lived in, um, it it can certainly be uh, despair inducing. Um, but it there, what I always tell people is that there's also a lot of power in it. I, and I think part of what, part of what animated this book and animates so much of my work is that I remember growing up as like a young kid in new Orleans and having all of these messages, um, being inundated with all of these messages about why black people lived in the conditions that we did. Um, and, you know, I was always told that New Orleans is the murder capital of the nation and we incarcerate more people per capita than China and Iran and uh, Russia and all these authoritarian regimes. And implicit within that is this idea that, like, look at this majority black city with these black people who can't control themselves, who are violent, who are enmeshed in poverty uh, because of their own failures. And I feel like growing up, I was never given the tools or the language or the framework or the history with which to understand how a city like New Orleans came to look the way that it does, right? And because if nobody's giving you those tools, when you're an eighth grade kid in your Louisiana history class, and you're having a conversation about Robert E. Lee and the Confederacy, um, and nobody's saying that like Robert E. Lee led a treasonous army predicated on maintaining and expanding the institution of slavery, then you fail to, you are not becoming equipped with the with the history that helps you better understand the the landscape of your city and also you know throughout not only slavery but through uh reconstruction and jim crow apartheid um mm -hmm. all of the generations of state sanctioned policy that has created what the contemporary landscape of inequality looks like and if you don't have those if you aren't given those then you then you begin to mistake the poverty or the violence or the disparities that certain communities experience as somehow being a result of something that those communities have done wrong, rather than the result of generations of compounding policies that have created those conditions. One of my favorite essays is by James Baldwin, um, and it's not one of his more famous ones, but it's one that means a lot to me, and it's called A Talk to Teachers. And he wrote it in 1963 uh, based on a speech that he gave to a group of New York City educators. And he says a lot of amazing stuff in there. But one of the things that he says is he's like, the role of the teacher is to help the young black child understand that even though the world tells them over and over again that they are criminal, it is in fact the society that created the conditions that that child is growing up in through no fault of their own that is in fact criminal. Right. And it's like a very simple, intuitive thing. But but there are so many young black children. I feel like I was one of them in many ways who grow up being told over and over again, all the things that are wrong with you, all the things that are wrong with people who look like you, all the things that are wrong with your community. And part of, you know, one thing that I hope this book can do is, you know, in, in many ways, I'm writing to a young, younger version of me and trying to give myself uh, a, a sense of the history um, that that wasn't that long ago, you know, like, you know, one of the obsessions of this book, and I, I kind of end with this in the chapter with my grandparents, is that w we tell ourselves the history of slavery was a long time ago when it in fact wasn't that long ago at all. Mm -hmm. You know, like my grandfather's grandfather was enslaved, you yeah. know, I, and so I have these moments where my son, my three-year-old son is sitting on my grandfather's lap. And I imagine my grandfather sitting on his grandfather's lap. And I'm reminded that there are people alive today who loved who had relationships with, who knew, who were raised by people who were born into slavery. The woman who opened the museum alongside the Obama family in 2015, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the woman who rang the bell to open that museum was the daughter of an enslaved person, right? Like her father had been enslaved and she was alive in 2015, opening this museum, documenting what her father had and she had experienced firsthand. And so I, you know, the idea that slavery has nothing to do with what our current uh, 
landscape, uh, social and economic and political landscape looks like is both morally and intellectually disingenuous. And, and I hope the book can be sort of one contribution among many uh, to help uh, to help people more effectively grapple with that. One of the things that I had this, uh, I mean, it wasn't an aha moment because you told it to me. So one of the things I learned from the book was this this idea that white supremacy creates numbness as much as it creates violence. Mm. That there's a, the, and it's, that sounds like educationally what might be happening is this uh, this opportunity to be kind of inured to this thing that was just is just a few generations old. And that's the thing that allows this kind of systematic progression is so many people are allowed to be numb to it or to, and to have their wedding on a plantation yeah. and to, you know, understand Angola as this thing that sort of rose up as itself and not something that's directly connected to the 13th yeah. amendment. Or no, absolutely. How, in, in what ways, you know, in, in what ways do you think, um, I don't know how, how would you, there, you go to so many museums and commemorative sites in the book. In what ways does that kind of public historical practice have the opportunity to like pierce that numbness? I mean, I think just in terms of numbers and logistically, I mean, you know, a place like, uh, you know, the Whitney plantation that I go to, uh, which is this really remarkable plantation museum in Louisiana. And it's, it's so important because it is the only museum in Louisiana or the only plantation in Louisiana that centers the lives of enslaved people and the stories of enslaved people, which which shouldn't be a remarkable thing because these are plantations. They are sites of intergenerational torture and, and chattel bondage. But it is surrounded by, a, a, as you say, a sort of constellation of plantations where people have weddings, where people are using the cabins as the slave cabins as, as bridal suites, where people are taking selfies in front of the homes of former enslavers. Um, and, and the Whitney is a place that fundamentally rejects that idea. It fundamentally rejects the idea that a plantation can and should be anything other than, one, an homage to the enslaved people who lived on and cultivated and built that land. And then, two, a recognition that it was a site of torture and exploitation over the course of generations for the people who lived there. Um, and, and I think part of what the the... Part of the importance of um, a place like the Whitney is, sorry, I, I forgot the original question. I was just thinking about, it's just, it's such an interesting thing that like looking at the way that Monticello tours have changed and this yep. tour that you can take in Wall Street now, right, of yep. the, the, the sort of Underground Railroad and the history of slavery in New York City. It's, it's this public tourism Oh, right. right. Yes. To like ad ad address yeah, yeah. that numbness. And it just seems like such an interesting vehicle for for the change that kind of has to happen in order to dismantle white supremacy further. Absolutely. Uh, blame my dad brain. For uh, the, it's my pandemic. No, I mean, I'm, I mean, your dad brain is crushing yeah, no, it, honestly. No. <laughs> I, um, so so uh, as I was saying, sort of logistically, the the a place like the Whitney, I was saying, gets a uh, hundred thousand before the pandemic, a hundred thousand people a year. Um, were coming to the Whitney Plantation, which is more than any book of pe you know, more people come to the Whitney than read any single book of slavery that I'm familiar with, right? Wow. And so, just if you just think about like the role public history can play, somebody who will go on a 60 minute or 90 minute tour of the Whitney might not pick up a 700, 800 page book. Um, by a scholar, you know, one of the most preeminent scholars on on slavery. But but what I tell people is that those both the historian of the archives and the public historian are in conversation with each other and need each other and have a sort of symbiotic relationship. Because I go to these places where the public historians are working, whether it's the Whitney or Monticello, uh, and and they are, you know, you go. I remember going to Monticello, and the woman who was the public historian there, Naya Bates had this desk that was full of books that was that were written by these these academics that I've similarly spent a lot of time with. And that informs what her practice is like. That informs how she trains the guides. That informs so so they need each other and they're necessary. And I think that part of what I wanted to lift up in this book was the w important role that public historians and public sites play um, in helping to shape these discussions for people who, 
for a variety of reasons, might not uh, be inclined to or have the capital to or, or the time or the resources to um, sit down and, and read, um, you know, a book by a professor at Harvard or Yale. Um, but but those books are important because then they shape how what these tours, what these tours looks like. And so uh, there's an entire sort of ecosystem um, that is dedicated to excavating and illuminating what the history of slavery has been and and how it shapes um, our world today. And and I wanted to just sort of tell the story of the various people who are doing that remarkable work. Which is another part of the ecosystem, right? Exactly. Is the, yeah. As we were getting the microphone set up and starting everything, we could hear your son, Clint, running around. Yeah. I'm just curious, <laughs> you know, what are you going to tell him about slavery when he's old enough to have that conversation or when he asks you about it? What I'll tell him is is what I believe and what I think about often um, is that from the moment enslaved people arrived on these shores, people were fighting for freedom and people were fighting for liberation. And, you know, oftentimes people will ask me questions about, like, are you hopeful? What do you, you know, will things change? And the way I think about it is that I am part of a, a lineage um, of people uh, and come from ancestors who who were fighting against the existence of an institution for 250 years that ultimately, and ultimately they won, right? Ultimately, slavery was abolished because of the work enslaved people had done across generations. But the vast majority of people who spent their lives to different degrees fighting against slavery never got a chance to see that, right? Like they never got a chance to see or experience freedom, but it's a reminder that we don't fight for what's right and we don't try to build a better world simply so we can experience the fruit of of that labor. We build a better world and we fight and we chip against this wall, right? And we don't know how thick the wall is. We don't know what the other, where the other side of it is, but we know that us chipping away at it means the people coming after us will have less to chip away at. And ultimately there will be enough people across generations chipping away at this proverbial wall that, uh, that, that ultimately somebody is going to, you know, hit the wall uh, to keep the metaphor going and, and see light on the other side. And and that's how I think of of the the work that so many people do now with regard to mass incarceration, with regard to immigration, with regard to policing, with regard to climate change. With I mean, all of this, it's like I I don't fight for an end to mass incarceration because I think that I will see a world in which prisons become uh, obsolete in my own lifetime. Um, but I hope to be a part of one part of like building a world um, where we are creating the social infrastructure necessary to make, you know, this carceral state increasingly less relevant in, in our everyday lives. And, and I think that's, you know, so when I tell him about slavery, I'm going to tell him about all the people who, who gave their lives to make his life possible. Um, and that we all we have a responsibility to um, in the different uh, social and political areas of our of our own lives um, continue chipping away at that proverbial wall for for the folks who come after us. Well, it seems to me this book takes a pretty big chunk out of that wall because there's just so much stuff in in here that I was unfamiliar with, didn't know about. And the other thing too, this is an odd compliment, but for such a important, serious, traumatic topic, this book is a really fascinating read. It, it's it's so well written. I mean, you're such a good writer that even though this topic is is again a, a very difficult one to grapple with, it, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel overwhelming to read to read this book. So, which is an amazing thing you pulled off. So, uh, the book is "How the Word Is Passed: A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America." Clint Smith, thanks so much for coming on Livewire. Thank you all for having me. All right. Well, thank you, man. That was a really, really great conversation. I appreciate it. And the book is excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, uh,